Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Heidelberg. Welcome to Troopers. I'm, I'm excited. It's, uh, uh, it's great to see so many people. And uh, some of you are here for the first time. And for those, I'll give some, say, introductory notes what Troopers is about. And um, Troopers is, is one part of, say, what we call our contribution. I mean, we, is, uh, we means e and w That's a company providing security services. But we do not only provide security services for our customers, we provide what we think a contribution to the public too, that is uh, a block, and that is Troopers. Troopers is one week, we hope your favorite, uh, say, week of the year, week full of education of um, things that hopefully make, uh, once you leave this, uh, once you leave Heidelberg uh, on uh, maybe tomorrow, maybe on Friday, uh, you will leave Heidelberg in, a, in an evolved state when it comes to your thinking and um, feeling about security. And uh, so this is what we, what we strive to, to provide with Troopers. Um, Troopers is not about, say, profits. Uh, there is no, we, we don't make any money with, profit, uh, with, with Troopers. Um, we, have, we never made, and maybe um, and this will never change, but this is not important. There are other parties uh, certainly making money with Troopers. Uh, they note in the, uh, say, peak in the crossings this week. But uh, Troopers is about um, education. It's about learning. Learning about security, about latest trends in both protection and attacks. Troopers is about having fun, as uh, having fun always helps with, uh, say, education. As you, uh, if you have kids uh, who are still are in school, they will, they will know, and you might remember that having fun helps with uh, learning. And Troopers is about, and this is a very important part, it's about interaction. It's about people talking to each other, uh, people uh, discussing ideas, people mixing up, and all this with one ultimate goal, that is make the world a safer place. I'm fully serious about this. This is what Troopers is about. And to make this interaction happen, to, make, uh, to help in making the world a safer place, uh, there is something that, which we call the magic troopers formula that is simply said as, that is you. Uh, that is, uh, say, the people who are here, the people who mix up, who discuss their ideas. And to give you an idea, uh, troopers, uh, there is very different groups of troopers. There is some um, ISOs, information security officers from very large organizations. Actually, there's many of them here. 
uh, those meet the community, industry meets academia, hackers meet, uh, meet students, and uh, in short, it's Troopers about, um, it's about Troopers meeting Troopers. Um, to give you some numbers, about one third of you is, uh, say, um, engaged in very large organizations, about one of eight of you is a, is a student. And uh, there is a number of researchers. And to make this interaction happen from these different, very different groups, we strive to uh, keep uh, troopers limited to a certain size. Uh, that is 200 seats. This year, for the first time, we have been sold out. Keep this in mind for next year. <laughs> and keep in mind uh, for next year, troopers is probably is always going to happen in Heidelberg. And Heidelberg, is, uh, there's a reason for this. Uh, first of all, Heidelberg has a reputation of being a very international city. In 1877, Mark Twain uh, came to Heidelberg and he wrote a travel report uh, laying out like how impressed he was about the, at the time, 1877, about Heidelberg being such an open and international city. And he came here to, to learn and evolve. That's why uh, he can be called a trooper. So, in the best sense. Heidelberg has not only a reputation of being open international, it has a reputation of being an, a city of education. Actually, we have the, uh, the oldest German university here. And education not only means, uh, say, education in a formal sense. In German, there is a term uh, Herzensbildung, where um, a Bildung means education, but not only in a formal sense, but growing in, uh, in your mind, in your soul, in your heart. Uh, and this is uh, one, one element of Heidelberg, which a number of thinkers and poets has explicitly mentioned when they came to Heidelberg. And uh, they somehow associated that with the philosopher's way, which we are going to visit uh, uh, tomorrow and during the 10K run. And you can see that the poets and thinkers I mentioned, you can see them here, contemplating about uh, uh, the world and the world of InfoSec. And uh, yeah, that's why Troopers is in Heidelberg. Open and international, it's about education, it's about interaction, it's about having fun. And I have not only seen Heidelberg in my life. Um, in 2007, I was uh, in Dubai at a conference. And there was a Brazilian guy who, who gave a talk, and I went to that, and I immediately spotted this guy uh, knows what he's talking about. So I will hand over here uh, to Rodrigo in a second. Uh, that's that. Enjoy Troopers, have fun at Heidelberg, have fun at Troopers, enjoy. Thanks. Hello, hello. Oh, okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I know it's very early in the morning and it's very cold outside, but well, I hope everybody's still awake. Uh, so, it's a pleasure to be here. It's not my favorite week in the year. I must admit, as a Brazilian, my favorite week in the year is the carnival, but it's one of my favorite weeks in the year. So I'm here to talk a little bit about like security research and uh, challenges on that field and why we are not solving the security problem. So I hope you don't mind, but it's going to be a lot of critics on the industry, on the way that we manage security in companies. And uh, I hope I will create a lot of theories and I will give you some ideas and some counterpoints and co counter arguments. Not all of them I will agree with myself. But I think it's, so important, it's always important to discuss and to look into other ways to really observe the problem and uh, approach the problem. So security, we know it's uh, a field that is growing. We know that uh, more and more attacks are becoming like public. The companies are trying to change the way they behave to the attacks. The countries are changing the way they react and the way that they actually do the attacks by themselves. And uh, this whole system is changing. So we need to look into that and see how do we participate and how can we influence that change. So for this talk, 
basically I'm going to, to justify the talk. I will try to give like some reasons for this kind of talk to happen and this open discussion to happen. Uh, I will explain a little bit about the difference between like vulnerability and malware research, uh, the difference in the approach, and uh, I will give you some ideas why people keep finding vulnerabilities, but we are not really fighting very well the malware. I'm going to show you the approach is completely different for finding vulnerabilities, how professional we are in the sense of finding vulnerabilities, and how immature we are in the sense of fighting against malware. And I will start discussing some missing points. I will try to put like why the academia is not really uh, helping a lot, uh, why the research community is so far away from the, from the actual implementations from what the companies are using, why those kinds of fights are happening, why AV is failing, and that's basically an economic reason for that. So there is no economic motivation for the AV to fix the problem. So we need to do something, not waiting for the vendors to do that. And uh, we will discuss a lot of myths on the security industry as a whole, okay? So to start, the objective of this talk is to question the truths, okay? A lot of things are known in the security industry as a, a, a something that is certain, something that is true, and not necessarily that's the case. So we're gonna like question that. Uh, I will also pinpoint some current problems that we all will agree they are problems, and I will create some theories, as I said. Not all of those theories I will agree with them myself, but I will give the theory anyway, so we can actually have an open discussion about these theories. So to justify this, this talk, so we all know, we all heard about like the Asian Pacific threats, or APTs. <laughs> I'm not going to say the APT is advanced. I refuse to say that. And I will explain like, uh, in, during the talk why I really can't say an APT is an advanced on attack. We're going to have a debate tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow or today? Uh, today at 4 p.m. And uh, in this debate, we're going to have the opportunity to discuss a little bit more about the APTs. But well, I will start with a theory. Everybody here knows about the Mandiant report about the attacks coming from China. Everybody heard about this report. So basically they wrote a report, they did a complete investigation on some of the attacks, and they wrote a report saying, yes, the attacks are definitely coming from China. They provide like some evidence and they provide like the mechanisms and how the attacks are performed and how they identified like the steps of the attacks. So basically they explain how the attacks from China work and why they identified those attacks as coming from China. So the report made the news. So the Pentagon was supporting the report saying, yes, the report is, is really clever. They really showing everything. So I have the first theory. Now any country that wants to attack some other country will mimic what the report says the Chinese are doing. And now more and more attacks will be attributed to China. Right? If I want to do an attack and I want to dismiss the attack instead of coming from Brazil or Germany, I want the attack to look coming from some other country, now I have all these steps. I have a report that helps me to do that. And uh, the reason that I am saying it is not because I want everybody to start like, looking like Chinese, but instead is, Attribution is very hard in IT security. So there is no such a thing as, hey, because these facts that are coming from China or not, it's very hard to actually say that. And as more as we say that, as more attacks will look like that, because other countries will simulate and we will mimic those attacks. So this is the kind of report that is senseless, in my opinion, okay? So sorry, guys from Mandiant. <laughs> <laughs> Continue. Like, we hear about a lot of news of mass outages, right? So we hear that, like, big companies are getting outed all the time. So Apple, Microsoft, well, it was interesting because Microsoft said the Apple division of them got outed. They never admitted the Microsoft, the Windows division got outed. But, well, that's another point to discuss. So all the companies are getting outed, and that's becoming more and more common. And everybody's always blaming the Chinese or uh, basically blaming the others. Nobody is actually saying, hey, I did something wrong, right? Everybody always says the attacks are very advanced, very advanced, and there were no ways for us to fight this attack. So my mom, when I was a child, she always used to tell me when I said, hey, mom, buy this to me, that's very cheap. 
She was always saying, well, it's, it, to be cheap depends on how much money you have, right? That, that, that's what defines cheap or expensive. So if we generalize this knowledge, to be advanced it depends on how much knowledge you have. So when I see like a company like RSA coming and saying, hey, these attackers are digital naive SEALs, they are really advanced. And when I look into the attack and I see it's a really simple attack, uh, well, I'm not going to make a statement here. <laughs> so the question is, well, the attacks are advanced about based on the outlet company's knowledge, based on the media knowledge, because the media is always claiming the attacks are advanced, right? Or are they really advanced? Are we really questioning how advanced those attacks are? Are we looking to them or not? We're just like claiming they are advanced because it's very convenient and it's actually convenient to everybody. So if you look into the news, you have like all the data breaches, sophisticated attack, sophisticated attack. Rayton guy says, <laughs> the Rayton cyber chief was like claiming, wow, it's like a lot of cyber attacks. But you know, like if you really look into the news, look into that, look how interesting it is. 30,000 samples per day of APT. Whoa! <laughs> So it's really China. China is the only country which has enough people to do like 30,000 APGs per day. There is no other country with enough people, maybe India. <laughs> so, well, that's bullshit, right? We all know that. Great. So, Rachel, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope I don't need to work someday for those companies. I really hope, because I don't think they will hire me ever. So, uh, <laughs> So to start like argumenting, uh, I will make it clear that I always work as a vulnerability research. So like finding bugs and exploiting them was my job and I love to do that. And uh, you know, like at some point in my career, like uh, somebody told me that uh, I am like a schadenfreude, which I don't know how to pronounce, but basically means that it's somebody who enjoys when the others are suffering. <laughs> so I thought it, they had a point. I really, I really must admit that I kind of enjoy when like others are suffering in that sense of computer security. So I decided to move and start to look into the malware problem. So that's that's the the research that I'm currently doing for like three years. So the first thing when I moved like to look into the malware problem. I decided to have an idea of, hey, what is the difference between doing vulnerability research and doing malware research? So I could at least have an idea of the gaps, right? Or what they were missing, because I was sure that the vulnerability researchers are very effective. We're finding bugs all the time. We really have like hundreds of thousands of bugs in different kinds of software. So why the malware researchers are not finding this, the, the solution to the problem? Like we know that malware writers are always bypassing the protections. And when you look into the bypass, they are always simple, very stupid. Like one byte modification in your code, boom, the AV don't catch you anymore. So I, I really wanted to understand that. So when we look into like automate, automated vulnerability hunting, all the book says, okay, fuzzers. So we generate test cases. We have like millions of test cases to test the software. If we are not talking about millions, it makes no sense to talk about vulnerability hunting. When we look into the malware problem, we see companies like Kaspersky, they say there is 150,000 new malware samples per day. 150,000 new samples per day. But when you look into the books, the books only talk about automating one sample per time. So how do we automate the analysis of this specific sample? How do we write a plugin for the debugger to automate this step of the analysis? They don't talk about like, hey, how do we analyze millions of samples? That's kind of weird, right? They, uh, at the same time, everybody's claiming there is like hundreds of thousands of new samples every day. But when they automate, they only automate in one part of the step or one analysis of a sample. So look into all the frameworks that you have, like Cuckoo Sandbox. It's a great framework for analyzing samples, but it will let you analyze one at a time. You will need to do the automation to analyze millions. You need to have like the infrastructure to analyze millions. So it's kind of weird, right? How do you expect to generate the knowledge if you are not analyzing like enough 
to actually understand something about the attack. And that's the problem that I see with the malware industry. Like the AV companies, of course they do have like a lot of machines. They have like clusters of machines and they're analyzing like millions of samples every day, but they don't really share that knowledge. They don't show us the results they're getting. And when they claim something, it's very weird. Like you see like the researchers from like big companies, big AV companies, they say, well, we found, uh, we look into like 100,000 samples and we found like 10% uses this technique. 100,000 samples? It's less than one day, right? That does not make sense at all. Right? So they, uh, what they are hiding? Their researchers don't have access to their platform maybe? Or they don't have interest in sharing the information? And how the academia will actually keep up if the academia don't have access to the samples because all those companies, they share samples with each other, but they don't share samples with the other researchers. They don't share samples with the academia. And if they start sharing the samples, will the academia have the machine power to actually do something on that? That's why when we look into the academia in the security field, like a lot of the papers, like unfortunately, most of the papers make no sense at all. They really don't apply. They don't even ap will apply at some point in time, which is why the academia exists. So we, we have this gap, but this gap was created because the way the industry is behaving, per se. Not, it's not a uh, responsibility of the academia. And it's our responsibility as customers, as security researchers, to try to do something and try to change that. We need to force the vendors. And the only way to force the vendor is releasing facts and actually fighting against them. So the first missing point in here is the academia and researchers in general, not only the academia, but for example, when I started doing the research, I started like looking into the malware problem and I spotted, hey, I need samples. How do I know what the malwares are doing if I don't have malware, right? So I started asking people to send me malware and that was not the case. We know there is some initiatives like Contagio Dump, they try to share samples, but if you look into the numbers, they are very, very, very limited. Like VxShare is like a, a very nice project. So they share like 4 million samples for researchers. But 4 million samples, it's not really much. It's what, a month? So when I look into that, I was like, okay, nobody is actually able to get access to those samples and to have the machine power to analyze the samples. We need to change that. So keep in mind that if you want to, uh, to play with malware, if you really want to understand malware, you need to have like millions of samples. You need to have the machine power to analyze those samples. So uh, I have a question. Is AV failing? Every attack that we see, every new attack that we see, the AV industry has a new excuse to not catch it, right? Usually they say, wow, this is pr pretty new, or this targeted specifically us. Symantec was blaming like, uh, the Wall Street guys, Wall Street Journal, for the attack to actually succeed, right? Symantec was like, hey, they were not using all the features of our product. Well, if your product has some feature, why you even let the customer disable it? If you do that, you are actually sending your responsibility of protecting the customer to the customer. It's really not fair. If the customer gets a false positive, Symantec will say, yeah, you had the option to disable that feature. But if the customer don't catch the malware, Symantec will say, yeah, you know, you are not using that feature. That's really not fair game. That's really not the way that you play with a customer, right? And they can do that because, well, which other option you have? The other companies are doing exactly the same. You really don't have a way to escape from that. So I like the case of Stuxnet. Well, Flame, Stuxnet, they all stayed around for like five years without being caught. And uh, it's interesting because everybody talked about like how advanced the Stuxnet was, right? The industry loved to say it was really, really advanced. They had like zero days. They were exploiting everything. So wow, they are really advanced malware, cyber weapon, government sponsored. But okay, what Stuxnet had that bypasses AV? It was only one resource to bypass the AV. They basically split the malware in two pieces, a kernel component and a loader. So when the loader tries to load some, some part of the malware, 
Like the, the normal system will say like the DLL being loaded does not exist, but the kernel component will load it anyway. So basically what they did was like they split the malware in two different sections and the AVs were not able to catch it. And I'm gonna tell you, they are not going to be able to catch it very soon because most of the AVs, if not all of them, but at least all of them that I look at, that, they have like pair process monitoring. So if you have two different processes that together will do something malicious, they have no way to know that. They just don't. So I have a theory. AVs are all about signatures, right? Even when they say they have like behavior-based detection, they need to hard code the behavior that they detect as malicious. They are not really evolving naturally. They are not really learning that this behavior is malicious on this environment. So the behavior detection that they say are pure like coded signatures that are not pure rejects. But it, they are still signatures. If the malware does this, this, and this, it's a malware. If it doesn't, it's not a malware. But still, it's just a signature. If our defenses are based on signatures, and the same applies for IPS, IDS, AV, firewalls, whatever, we always need to know how the attack looks like in order to detect the attack, right? We have just a few technologies nowadays that actually look into our network and try to really find something that is different. And we know that those, those technologies are not really widely spread right now. So if most of our defense or all of our defense are based on signatures, how can all the security guys are saying we don't need to really understand how to attack? If we don't understand how to attack, we will never be able to actually look into the signatures and know if the signatures are enough or know if we need more or know if we are catching like really interesting attacks or not because we are not looking into the way the attacks really work. Like most of the security guys, they say, no, I don't need to know about software exploitation. I don't need to know how to write malware. If you say, hey, I will give a training about like how to write malware, people will say, wow, you're crazy, you're teaching people to write malware? But that's an important knowledge. Understand that the bad guys will learn it anyway. It makes no difference if I am going to teach or not, they will learn it anyway. But the good guys need to also have the knowledge. Otherwise, they will just make assumptions that are completely wrong. Uh, so, is it possible to detect everything? Actually, it's not, okay? So, Fred Cohen uh, in H7 already used like a, di a diagonal argument. So, basically, he proved that the looking for a malware and knowing if a process is malicious is, can be reduced to the same problem as the Turing, for example, proof of the indecibility of the halting problem. So, think about that. If you have a program that receives as input other programs and say if it's malicious or not, the malicious program can use this program, and if this program says it's malicious, the malicious program will just exit. Right? If, the, if this program says the, the, the malicious code is not malicious, then it will do the malicious thing. Right? So it's the same problem of understability of the halting problem. This is unsolvable. There is no way to solve this question with a computer. So there will be no way a computer will know for sure if something is malicious or not. But we can do some things. We can do really good things. We can force the attacker to some situations. We know some, some characteristics are malicious. We don't need to go only for signatures. We don't need to go only for, hey, we know this malware is malicious. We can start detecting the techniques the malware use. We can start detecting like specific points that the malware will need to do. And we can try to force the malware to be simpler. Nowadays, it's very weird because when you look into the industry, and like everybody's saying, hey, the malwares are packed, the malwares are obfuscated, the malware uses anti-disassembly, the malwares use anti-debugging. It's crazy. <clears throat> if the malware really don't want to be detected, it was supposed to be very simple. It was supposed to have nothing. It was supposed to be just be malicious, do the malicious thing, but not try to avoid the analysis. Because avoiding the analysis, you have a limited number of techniques to do. You have a limited number of techniques to bypass a debugger, to actually avoid the disassembly. It's a limited amount of techniques. If the AV vendors were effective, they were going to be detecting these techniques for a long time now. So we're only going to have like malwares like Stuxnet, that you know, like they don't really try to hide themselves. They just do what they need to do. And then it's a problem that we don't have a way to fix. 
So we can see that although the industry, the AV industry is like 15 years old, they still don't do like the basic stuff that they were supposed to. So look into that. Why AV hasn't won? Why AV is not winning, right? Why AV is not catching everything or most of the things, or at least like really having a good fight? Like, it was supposed to be a cat and rat game, right? But cat and rat game is supposed like, okay, the guys release a mower now, in two weeks I am detecting it, not in five years, right? Which is the case with Flame and Stuxnet. So look into that. If, if they win, if they really catch everything, they go out of the business, right? Because they don't have a way to sell anymore. So they cannot really go out of the business because then they lose, they don't win because they are out of the business. So the only thing that they can do is actually survive. And for survival, in survival mode, what they want is basically sell the same things again and again. And the customers don't really have a lot of options. They kind of complice to that. And uh, I will explain a little bit later why the customers are complice to that. And uh, I will use like some ideas from the economics in a, in a paper called Market for Lemons. But just so you guys have an idea, this statement, okay, is not mine. So Fred Cohen made this statement already in 2009. So the guy who actually proved that you can solve the problem. So yesterday we had this discussion and well, this discussion is actually recurrent. What is the difference between an AV and a rogue AV? That's a question that I received from a friend of mine like a while ago and I keep thinking about and uh, as more time passes, as less difference as I can see. Like, no, both does not guarantee me anything, right? So we, we saw that with the Wall Street incident that some of them, one of them, right, we were actually being beating me, like publicly, saying, hey, you didn't use all the features you were supposed to. Both have upgrade to premium, so both ask me for more money, right? Both will have a nice GUI. Actually, the Rogue AV usually have a much nicer GUI. It's like much better GUI. Uh, both will affect the performance, but the, but the Rogue AV is faster, I guarantee. Well, uh, both will have false alarms, which are like false positives. You guys remember McAfee blocking the SVC host and the machines of uh, like hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of customers not booting? Well, yeah, well, I never saw that happening with the Rogue AV. The false alarm of Rogue AV will only tell me, hey, buy the premium. They will never actually make my machine not working anymore. So I don't know, but uh, supposedly the Rogue AV is, is better for me. <laughs> I don't know if I, I can become like PCI compliant with a Rogue AV, but um, for sure they will start trying, right? Uh, it's interesting because some Rogue AV actually really remove other Rogue AVs from your machine. <laughs> so, how the malware spreads? How a malware actually gets into that amount, that amount of machines? Like we know that almost everything is infected, right? We just don't know yet the cases, the specific cases. But like after Flame, after Stuxnet, we can clearly know that like almost everything is infected. And at some point it will be infected. So we know that malware infection through user interaction. That's something that happens. And there's a lot of investments trying to fix the user mind. And that's recurrent investment, right? That's what the industry wants us to do. Because look, they sell you the training today. In six months, they will sell you again. Because now you have new users, new employees. <coughs> you change the employees, or you just need to remind your employees. So that's a recurrent sale, right? But well, why nobody's really working on avoiding the user to make mistakes? The user, the user is a user. He will never learn all the techniques. He will never learn all the ways to be manipulated. It's just impossible. That's, a, that's something you will never fix. Einstein said, right? There is no limits for the human stupidity and to the universe. But he was not sure about the universe. He said that. I believe in Einstein more than I believe in Symantec, McAfee, or any other security vendor out there. <laughs> really, I do believe in Einstein. <coughs> So, why we are not working on resilient systems? Systems that let the user be a user, right? So he uses the system, but he will never actually make damage to the system. I know that might be very difficult for like homes and like the guy has his own equipment and his own machine, but for corporate, well, you control the desktop of the user, right? So supposedly, 
you can avoid changes, you can avoid like things to happen that will be bad. So, nice. Then you're gonna tell me, yeah, but uh, there is no way that that's going to work in the end user with like the normal users, not in the corporate. Well, do you guys know Apple, right? iPhones, can the user do much in the iPhone? No. It's very controlled, it's very limited, and still the users love it. Who is going to tell me the iPhone is not a success? And it's a very difficult platform to hack. Very difficult. There are hacks? Yes, there are. But you, you don't see like spread like crazy like in the PC world, right? And you have like thousands of softwares for iPhone. You have lots of opportunities and lots of vulnerable softwares out there. But they're very difficult to exploit. They're very difficult to be reliable exploit. They have like a lot of layers of protections. They have ways to avoid rootkitting. So it's a nice platform. It's a closed platform. The user can make whatever mistakes. The user can go and can install like the applications on Apple Store. He can like play games with whatever user. He don't need to know the user he's playing a game with. He don't need to know if the link he received in the email is a good link or a malicious link. He don't need to know how to look into the, into the protection of the browser. He just do whatever he needs to do, and he's good with that. So that shows it's possible to do that and still be in business. Why others are not doing it? Maybe because they will kill a whole industry, which is like the security industry? It's difficult to know, right? But then like, if you avoid the mistakes of the user, you still have the other way for the malware to actually spread. You have the vulnerability exploitation. And that's becoming more and more common. Okay, zero days, like in Java. Java, you, you guys all know Java, right? Just another vulnerability announcement. <laughs> so everybody knows Java, great. <laughs> so uh, I, I think everybody here saw that uh, the CVE is increasing one number, right? It's just because of Java. If it were not, no Java, the CV was going to be okay. So the truth is, we see there is zero days. There are vulnerabilities that you don't have patches for. And like the exploit kits and the malware authors are starting exploiting more and more of those vulnerabilities. So that's why you see the, the, the malware is spreading faster and faster. And in the past, usually the exploit that we see in exploit kits were very simple. They didn't bypass protection, but now they are evolving. They are learning. Well. I have a bad news. That's just going to be worse with the time, right? We're giving time for them to learn. In the beginning, when they started doing like exploitation, they had no knowledge. But now, like five years later, when they started releasing the first exploit kits, now they had time to learn. Why the industry is not really keeping up? It's very difficult to accept that you know, like, we still have like, a slow process for fixing. We still have like, companies not caring about like, security reports. We still have those problems. We were supposed to have fixed them for a long time, but we didn't. So they're still making money, right? And if they are making money with malware and actually using exploits to install the malware and make money, well, they will keep learning. If we had, we, if we had fixed this problem, a while ago, they were going to say, hey, there is no money here anymore. OK, I will do something else. But we didn't. So as long as we take to fix the problem, as more difficult it will get to fix it. And uh, that's a bad news. So why software can be exploited? So Sergey Bratos, well, a Troopers veteran, created a definition called like weird machine. So imagine that you have the Turing machine, which is basically the computing capabilities of your software. When the attacker exploits your software, your software enters in a state that is manipulated. It, it's not the original state of the software, it's not the intentional state of the software, it's a new state of the software. That's a weird machine. So an attacker will actually manipulate the weird machine to get whatever access he wants, either to bypass authentication, to get code execution, to do whatever. If you think about like group theory, Basically, the attacker has some primitives, so he has access to some things inside a machine, and he will group them together to, get, to leverage what he wants. So exploitation is becoming hard. It's not as easy as it used to be. That's true. Like, we evolved. The operating systems evolved against the exploitation, against exploitation. So if you look into Windows 8, it's much more difficult to exploit than Windows XP. But that alone does not solve the problem, right? 
After the user, after the, there is a vulnerability, after the vulnerability is exploited, after malware is installed, it's still the same problems remain. We don't have ways to check the integrity of the system. We really don't have resilient ways to avoid the installation of this mechanism in our machines. We don't have a ways to know if somebody is stealing our information or not. The protocols are still not totally safe. So what is the difference between a primitive and a technique? In the past, we had like basically techniques. So let's think about one specific one, like the T-delete. T-delete is a technique to exploit like heap overflows on Solaris. So T-delete, basically, if you have a heap overflow in Solaris, if you organize the chunk of the memory in a specific way, and it's well documented the way, you're going to get into, a, into the T-delete function. In an exact instruction that will overwrite four bytes of data that you control in a location that you want. So basically, you have a write for. So this is a technique. If you do that, you don't even need to understand the internals of what is going on. You just need to get the chunk in that format, and you're going to have like a write for primitive. And a write for is a primitive. If you have it, the game is over. The problem with primitive is they are vulnerability specific. Like, how do you know, how do you get a write for primitive in a specific software? Well, if you don't really have a technique to do that, that's going to be very specific to the vulnerability that you're playing with. So grouping together the primitives is what you need to actually exploit software. But if you force the primitives to be very hard to achieve or very unreliable, then you have more chances to win. A good example is address space layout randomization. What is the idea? The idea is you're changing the layout of the memory of the program and you make it much more difficult for the attacker to exploit the program. He needs now either to have something that is not randomized or have some leak of information of something that is randomized, but they leak the information back to them so they can actually know the addresses. Other than that, they are just brute forcing. And brute forcing does not work well for client-side exploits. Nice. So we know that. Why we are not using it? Like, why are we still using Windows XP Service Pack 2? It's like, I don't understand. I really don't. Well, maybe you have compliance requirements, some specific software. OK, I really don't think you have this specific software in your whole organization. So if you're using Windows XP Service Pack 3, why, why you are you not using DEP? And uh, if you're using that, why don't you just go like to Windows 7 with address based randomization or Windows 8? Or if you have Mac to the latest versions, which will have a better randomization, or Linux with packs, which is open source patch. So no matter how much techniques, how, how much advancements we make in defense, no matter how good the researchers are improving the defense, if the companies don't use them, that's not going to change anything. Right? So, when I go like to discussions, I always see people saying, yeah, we, do we need more stuff for defense? For sure, we need to improve the defense. But right now, the most important point is we want people to start using what we already have. When we see like a security vendor, a big security vendor, using Windows XP Service Pack 2, no DEP at all, that's a shame. And if it's a shame, why nobody's blaming them? Why are making money out of the incident? And I'm talking specifically about RSA here. Why are they making money out of that? They go into customers and say, hey, now we know APT. We investigated. Now we know everything about the subject. How that's possible? By the way, if RSA sponsors troopers next year, I don't tell their name. That's a good one, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> So, those kind of questions are the ones that people need to start asking, okay? How can they make money out of something that they were supposed to be very ashamed of? That's a good question in the industry. So, I decided to have a look into the world. So, yesterday, I, I sit down and I was like, okay, let's look into the data coming from different vendors. So, I, actually, it's very nice, like, uh, all the maps, okay? So, if you need to write a report, it's always good, like, to have the links. So, you have, like, different vendors showing different maps of how the world is right now. Uh, what is interesting is you don't really find a match. So, I don't know, because, like, the methodology that they, they, they publish is not really clear. So, they don't really say how many systems they're monitoring. I think that's for competitive reasons. But, for example, 
because uh, say 0% of uh, attacks in, in Germany. Well, I'm looking specifically in Germany. But uh, if you look here, like Akamai is seeing like a 6.2% increase, which is a lot, right? It's like 6% more than the normal. I don't know what is the normal. If the normal is 0, 6.2% more than 0 is not necessarily a lot. <laughs> so if you look here in the other map, like Shadow Server is saying Germany is a victim. So they, you guys are being attacked by the world. But well, it's interesting because Brazil, which is like kind of a huge country, has nothing. I don't know if they don't have customers there because they don't really publish that information, right? But Brazil is famous for being like the source of a lot of attacks. I don't know. So uh, in, in this map, you can't even see Germany. I don't know. I think it's the Third World War. Right? <laughs> so Iran decided to use the nukes, and you can't see Germany anymore. So probably that means there is a lot of attacks happening in Germany, different than the zero or different than the 6%. And here you have one. So maybe it's the only customer they have in the country. I don't know. <laughs> the point here is not that the information is not nice. It's really cool they publish this kind of maps. But uh, what is the scientific data behind it, right? How many machines? How are they collecting it? What is the database it on? Where is the technical details of that? Without technical details, this is just marketing. How do we know if it's not an Ajax interface generating random numbers? <laughs> right? It might be. I don't know. I have no idea. It might be. OK? So if you look into owning the world, like uh, it's interesting because like if you, if, if you think about like how long it takes until the first attack happens and then all the machines are being attacked. Uh, if you're looking for worms, it's now 10 minutes. So in 10 minutes, if you have like a wormable vulnerability, it means like after the first attack, in 10 minutes, all the machines are going to be compromised. If you think about, look into Stuxnet. Stuxnet had worm capabilities, right? And it was supposed to attack a specific location, apparently, I don't know, but apparently. But it spread in the world, right? It, it infected a lot of other machines. And it was using a vulnerability that was fixed already. OK, the wormable vulnerability was fixed already. But still, it spread like crazy. It infected countries like US, Brazil, right? What Brazil has to do with nukes, right? We don't go to wars. But it's still, we got infected. So it's interesting to see that, because like, uh, the researchers are saying it's going to take even less time in the future, in the very near future. If you consider like client-side exploits, we can see that, right? Java, the Java vulnerability, it was a zero day, it was spotted on the wild. Like after a week, you already had like all the exploits kits with the zero day in. But how long it took Oracle to patch Java? Well, two weeks, three weeks, one month. So it always change, right? They don't really complain. They don't really have like a high standard. So it really depends. But the problem is it always takes more time than the exploit kits to develop the exploit. And that's because the exploit was not really released on the wild. If they really had access to the exploit itself, that was going to be much faster for them to have it in. So when Metasploit released the exploit, next day you see the exploits on the exploit kits. So that's not really good, right? That's why like Apple decided to remove Java from, from the Macs, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but is it worth to have a zero day? Well, Justine Atel from Immunity, she said so. If you look into how long you, you stay with your zero day, like 348 days in average. In the worst case, 99 days with that zero day. Think about, you want to commit a crime, you have a zero day, you're going to stay with it for a year. In the worst case, three months, it's stealing people. That's because Oracle decided that they take some time to fix even after they spot it. So don't matter if a researcher comes and gives the zero day to Oracle or to any other company. They still need to take some time to fix. And I do understand, don't, don't, don't think that I'm blaming them. OK, I understand they need to test. They have multiple platforms. They have like, it's difficult for them. I do understand. But still, if there is a zero day on the wild, you need to do something. 
And we need to start blaming them for not doing it. We really need to. And if the customers are not actually do the ones doing the blaming, that's not going to change anything. If me, as researcher, go to a talk and I say shit to, about that, that's not going to make a difference. They have a much powerful marketing team over there. They can manipulate the media. They can actually make the news not look so bad. They can do something. But if all the customers start blaming that, they will have no options. They will need to change something. Uh, so talking about myths. In the security industry, we have these myths, right? One of them, the one that I like more, is the expert myth. It's interesting because all the sales guys from the security vendors, all the sales guys from security vendors, they are called experts. It's interesting, right? They are sales guy. They are expert in what? In sales, not in security. How come? But still, they are called experts. So they are the security experts of the vendor. And uh, they're like, talking about like the market for lemons, I think you guys remember that I say the customers are complicit with that situation. But understand that I'm not really blaming the customers. Okay? The Georgia Kerloff wrote a paper called The Market for Lemons. Uh, it's a paper that I love. Okay? It's about economics. And uh, actually, it took him like six months for the paper to be approved in any conference because the paper was so simple that nobody actually gave value to the paper. But after it got approved and got published, he won a Nobel in economics because of that paper. Basically, in the paper, he looks into the car market, okay? car sales market, used car sales market. And he tries to understand, hey, why a used car loses the value, right? You get a car, you just bought it, brand new. You just take it out from the, from the company that you just bought it, and then you decide you didn't like it. I don't know, the color is not fit anymore, or you divorced, so now you need a fancy car to get, like, nice girls, or whatever. <laughs> don't matter, right? You just decide to, you don't want the car anymore. But still, if you try to sell it, the car will lose his, its price, like 10%, 15%, right? And the reason is because the guy who is buying your car don't have as much knowledge as you do on the reasons for you to sell the car. So the car don't know if you're really selling because you just want a fancy one, you just changed your mind, or if you're selling because you spotted a problem. Maybe the motor has a problem. Maybe the car has a specific problem. Maybe you know there will be a new one coming in the next week. So that's why you decide to sell. So there is an asymmetry in knowledge between who is selling and who is buying. This asymmetry in knowledge also exists in the security industry. Look, the vendor really understands about his product. He knows everything about his product. And the vendors understand a lot about the marketing they are playing with. They understand about the attackers. Don't think that, you know, like Kaspersky, Trends, Symantec, they, re they really have really good guys. Really good. Like the best malware analysts are working there. Like they really are good on this. But the matter is, they have this understanding. They also understand the competition. So they, want, they don't really want to be as best as they can. They just want to be better than the other. And they have the asymmetry knowledge. So they can easily convince people who, who are buying. It's difficult to remove this asymmetry, right? Because you go to all the conferences, and the vendors are the ones doing the speech. Right? So they will convince you, hey, we have this brand new technology. Now it's all behavior and like McAfee comes to the public and say, hey, we don't have signatures anymore. It's all behavior. We are magic. You run our software and we are magic. We know what is malicious and what is not. That's crazy, right? But that's the way it works. Unfortunately, there is an asymmetry. And it's really not easy to fix that. In the same paper, George Akerlof proves that even if you have good intentions, even if you do have good intentions, even if you want to tell, to tell the truth, even then, you don't survive on the market. Because that's the way the market for lemons happens. And he proves that. It's from 57, the paper. Okay? But that's economically proven. That even if a player wants to play well in the market, he will probably be destroyed by the other players. Because he will need to try to change the market and look into the amount of money that all these security vendors have. Most of them are inside even bigger companies. They are big by themselves, but they are inside even bigger companies. So it's very hard for a player to change the market. The only way 
is if uh, the consumers actually remove the asymmetry. So without academia, without like education, we don't really have any way to fix the problem. Okay? So it's, it's just impossible. There will be no way that we're going to go and convince Symantec or any other vendor. And understand that I have nothing against them. That's the way. That's, they need to survive, right? And the companies are important for, for your health, right? We, we, need, we need the employers. So it's not like I'm really blaming them. It's just the way it is. And it's proven that's the way it is. That's how economics work. So if we don't really support academia, if we don't really support the education, if we don't really share knowledge, nothing will change because of the asymmetry. The vendors, they can't do much by themselves. It's important that we, we know it. They really can't do much, even if they want to. There is another problem in, 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 in computing and computer security, which is like the S factor. You know, I first heard about the S factor when I was in IBM. Uh, I remember like my very first day in IBM, right? And they have like, like this, this, uh, this guy who was a distinguished engineer, a really high position, in a tech, really high technical position in IBM. And they got him to give a, a presentation to the new employees starting on the engineering, right? So the AGR was expecting him to talk about how good it is to work for IBM and how good it is the uh, Y career, right? So you can be a technician and be really high in IBM and receive a really great salary and all that. But in fact, the most important message that he gave was the S factor and how the S factor works. So I will ask exactly the same question that he did. Why somebody buys from IBM? So, you know, you are a new employee, right? So what do you say? Wow, it's a great company. Wow, it has a lot of technology. Wow, it, it, it dominates all the production factors of the technology, whatever, right? You, you try the good answers. And uh, he said, no, it's more expensive. It's a slow company. It's bureaucratic. Not necessarily the best guys will be the ones who will actually serve you. But there is the S factor. Nobody will be fired for buying IBM, right? When something wrong happens, you have the ass, and it's not yours. <laughs> so that's the ass factor. Sorry, but that's the truth. And uh, <laughs> the matter is, this is also documented in the economics. So Gary Becker, he wrote a paper like uh, called Crime and Punishment, where he claims he, he was like the first guy to have like a, the courage to come out and say, hey, there is no sense in trying to fix all the crimes. Because like everybody wants to be a good guy, right? Everybody wants to have like 100% no crimes, right? You really don't want people getting killed on the streets. You really don't want people getting like robbed, assaulted or whatever, right? You want to have no crimes life. But he was the first one who had like, the courage to look into that and see if it that was feasible. And he was the first one to say there is no 100% security. We don't, most of us don't even know where that came from, right? There is no 100% security. So that comes from this guy, Gary Becker. And he proves that if you achieve 100% security, the costs go so high and it changes the whole industry. And then it creates so, other, so many other problems that the crime starts rising again. And that's the same with security. If we actually fix, let's imagine now, now, there is no security bugs anymore, no ways to exploit bugs, no hours. What are we all going to do? Retire. Retire? Well, I don't have enough money to retire. Maybe you'll give me a job in, in your company. And <laughs> so the matter is, we will create a big problem, right? And the problem is now we're going to have like very smart security people that knows a lot about the companies they work for, some smart security researchers, some crazy Brazilian security researchers, and suddenly they don't have money anymore. What they will do? They will find new ways, right? <laughs> and uh, that's why there is no 100% security. So I'm not claiming we can really solve the problem. We can't, that's the truth. The problem will remain. But the way it is nowadays, it's ridiculous, right? You get like the, the neighbor, the son of the neighbor, 10 years old, is hacking stuff. That's not supposed to be like that. That's not supposed to be that easy, 
right? We already using software for a long time. I don't want to see the electrical power grids being shut down because like some kid decided it, right? If it's a nation with a lot of resource and they have the capability to do, but they also will be punished, right? For doing it. They will also have like the, the way back. They have like things to lose. The problem is nowadays, the state of security is anybody can do whatever. That's what we cannot accept. Because there is people out there that have nothing to lose. And if they can do whatever, pretty soon bad things will happen, right? So we don't want that state of security. And uh, thinking about the S factor again, well, we buy from a specific vendor just because everybody's buying. That's really not a good way to, to make decisions. I do understand the S factor. I do understand nobody wants to get fired. But we have like a smarter smarter ways to make decisions in, in, in companies. Another problem is, another myth, is like the comp computational power growth. So everybody believes the security enjoys the Moore's law, right? The computers are getting faster, we have more capabilities to do like inspection, so like the gateway will survive, and we're gonna do deep package inspection everywhere. People still try to claim that, but that's not true, okay? Security does not enjoy the Moore's law. And the reason is very simple. As more computational power do we have, as more power we have, as more complex the protocols get. Because people will add compression, people will add encryption to the protocol layers. And of course they will do that because the bandwidth is not really growing as fast as the computer power. So, so security will always be behind. We're always going to be like the weakest link. If we need to really inspect everything, we're screwed. Security needs to be embedded in. If it's not, there is no way we're going to fix the problem. So that's an important message for the academics. Because the academics are still trying to say, no, now we're improving the performance of like the higher computers. So the new generation of computers will be able to compute that new idea. Sorry, that's not going to happen. The new generation of computers will have like companies writing even crazier software, even crazier like encryption algorithms, even crazier compression algorithms, and they're going to use all the computer power. There will be nothing left for the inspection. If security is not really embedded in, if security is not embedded in the software, we are not going to be able to do security. Don't count on the Muir's law, please, really don't. And so, okay, we don't have any ways to win. That's great, right? <laughs> We're going to lose. So uh, I'm not sure if it's like a, a security is like for losers. I don't like to lose, OK? So I like to win, but I like to win small battles. I don't expect to win the war, but I expect to fight until the last minute, right? <laughs> yes. So uh, in Brazil, we have this saying, right? Uh, if somebody has a gun and you don't, right? How do you fight the guy? Well, he has a gun, you don't, right? No matter how strong you are or how fast you are. But well, we can always run and moving, right? It will be more difficult for him to shoot you. So that's what they like in the security we need to try to do. What is the only advantage that we have over our opponents? It's the fact that we know our environment. We owe it. So if we don't know our own environment better, that's the first mistake we are making. If you guys think you don't really know your environment, you're making a big mistake. So that's the first thing we need to change. Before even thinking about, hey, I will buy a product or whatever, think about, hey, how much do I know everything that I have, everything that I own? If you don't, you don't have your only advantage. That's the only advantage you have. And this advantage is really, really strong when you look into some specific systems. Look into the bank ATMs. A bank ATM is not supposed to change. It's a specific device. If you know it, if you really know it, you can make it so safe that nobody will be able to change the ATM. The same for SCADA networks, for some router devices. The device is not supposed to change. It's not a general purpose device. It's different than a user and machine. And for the user machines, well, you can have like white listening, you can have like technology that will inspect and that will really try to understand your machine, that will try to make the state of the machine fixed. It. And you can check that. So if you don't leverage, like the only advantage that you have, you don't have any ways to win. Okay? You really don't.
And well, we need more applied science, right? Uh, computer and computer security is supposed to be like a, a science. It's supposed to be something that you prove, something that you test, something that you know, not something that you think or you believe, right? That's something that we need to change in this industry. Uh, so I will give like two examples of like a published papers. Well, I was involved in the paper, that's why I chose the examples. But then like that forced something that tries to put like science on it. So the first one I released it on black, which was basically like trying to detect techniques that the malware use to avoid the detection. So that paper came out from the idea that I started like looking into the malware problem and I started like automating the malware analysis. And I asked it to myself, okay, if I want to automate and everybody out there is saying, hey, the malwares are detecting the VM. So how do I automate like millions of samples to run if I need to run them in real machines? That's really bad, right? But everybody was saying, hey, most of the samples look into the VM technology we're using. Most of samples don't run on VM. I saw like some vendors, right, saying, hey, you need to use our sandbox because it does not have VM technology. We are like super smart. We manage to run millions of samples simultaneously in a real machine, but it's only one machine and we can do that. They are super smart. I was like, wow, uh, is that true? It's not? Or like, what are the numbers? So I decided to look into the numbers. So I decided to detect like the amount of samples using and really detecting VM technologies. I will show some of the numbers. You guys are gonna laugh on that. <laughs> then later on I saw, okay, if I can, if they were like, not really telling me the truth about VM technologies, what about other technologies that the malware employs, like anti-debugging, anti-disassembly, like obfuscation? So I started like collecting all the techniques out there and trying to detect the specific technique, which I thought the security industry, the AV industry, were going to be doing for years. But it was really, really interesting because there were no documentation for most of the techniques. The documentation was like basically one guy saw a malware using a specific technique, so he did like a blog post, and the blog post was focusing on how to bypass the technique and not how the technique actually worked. So there were like a lot of uh, 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 mistakes and errors on what the guy assumed the technique was about. And uh, so this was like a paper that uh, uh, me and, and some friends, we released the paper in Black Hat, and the paper basically states all the techniques that we managed to find, and together with the paper, we, we provide like a, a, an example of the implementation of each of the technique. Okay, so if you guys want to develop a malware, now you have all the techniques there. If you are an AV company, now you don't have an excuse to not detect the techniques anymore because you have samples for each of them. So no excuse to anybody anymore. And uh, basically what, we, what I was expecting with the paper was to force all the malware authors to fall back to not using packers, not using like obfuscation, not using anti-debugging. So my life was going to be much easier to analyze the malware samples. That didn't happen, but you know, <laughs> maybe at some point. And uh, the other one is very stupid presentation. Uh, it was like for RSA conference. <laughs> it's not really very stupid. Actually, it's, 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 it's an important point. But basically what we did was like, we got uh, some of the so-called APT attacks, and we got a Windows machine, a Windows box, that the attack succeeded against, right? So then we just you know, like upgraded to the latest service pack of Windows, we enabled like DEP, we changed some options of Adobe Reader, and then we tested this very advanced attack. We didn't install any security software, we just enabled DEP, and change it like one option in Adobe Reader, one option in Office, and suddenly all this so advanced attacks stopped working. Unbelievable. It's like really crazy, like no money spent, really no money spent. So we documented that in the presentation and uh, I guess that everybody was going to be using that in, 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 in computer networks at some point, but still not the case. So, uh, look into the, into the malware problem, as I mentioned, like th that paper was like, look into like, what is the amount of malware that actually do something bad or that try to protect themselves? So the, in the paper, I documented like what, what was the test case, the test bad, how we did the test, everything is documented on the paper. Here I am just simplifying the data, just so you guys know. So we analyzed like four million samples like for this presentation. So it's interesting that everybody's talking about like 
unpacking malware and uh, like uh, how complex it is to unpack malware. And when you talk to vendors, they always pointing out the unpacking technology they have and all that. But from the malware that we look at, 65% were not packed at all. So it's not really, doesn't really matter if they are packed or not because the majority were not. And still, of course, 34 is still a big number. But I don't really believe on the companies. And when I look into a number that I don't like, I try to go deeper in the number to see if I start liking it. <laughs> so going deeper, you see that 16% of the packers are actually UPX, which is trivial to unpack. 6.87% are Armadillo, which I already have on either plugin to unpack. 2.36 were PE Compact, which I have, have like plugins to unpack. Well, 1% were like a stupid like a Delphi packer, and then like you're talking about 1% of the samples, and that just goes down. So, you know, these fancy packers that you know, like get the media, and people, wow, now there is a real advantage. Well, that's, they are not really used. Sorry, guys, but that's the case. Uh, if you look in Brazil, wow, Brazilians are very advanced there. Like, more than half percent, barely more than half a percent of the Mars in Brazil do use packers. Wow, that's why we are famous Mario writers. <laughs> well, look in general, like 88% of the Mowers do have some technique to avoid detection. That's interesting, right? Because like we're looking into like uh, 50 techniques, 50 different techniques, 88% 8, 8 of the Mauer have something like that. That basically means if you're only detecting 50 techniques that exist out there, you will already detect 88.96% of all malware. It's very easy to detect in malware, right? The truth is, all the malware, we're supposed to not use protection because using a protection mechanism is actually something that is very limited. You have just a few number of techniques and it's very likely that you are a malware, okay? It's just a small number of normal programs that really use this kind of technique. So I only know Skype. Maybe there, there are others, but I only know Skype, okay? Yeah, sorry? <laughs> also a malware, yes. Well, but Skype is a different kind of malware, right? <laughs> so the matter is, the, the number, if you really look into more techniques, if you really like start to look into, into the false positives, because some of the things that could generate false positives, I assumed it was unprotected, but the number is actually higher. Okay, so you can detect almost 90% of the malware out there only with 50 techniques. But that goes even worse for the AV industry. If you really start to look into the protections that they use, like 81% uses anti-VM, 68 like obfuscation, 43 debugging, and 12% use anti-disassembly. Of course, some of them use both, right? That's why there is like, a, it's more than 100% in the total. That's kind of obvious, but the most important point is, you see, the, the industry were not lying about MTVN. They were telling the truth. Since I didn't like that, I really wanted them to be lying, so I decided to have a deeper look on it. And uh, it's interesting, because 99% of those malware are actually detecting VMware, specifically VMware. So all those sandbox techniques, I started looking deeper on them. Like, Trend Micro has a product that do like do deep package inspection and run the malware in a sandbox. And it happens it is virtual box. <laughs> ah, nice, huh? So I started reversing it. Well, all the vendors are actually using like a virtual box, Zen, KeyMu. They just do some modifications on it, but they're using the technologies that are out there. So they are not magical. They just didn't like put a marketing layer and evolve the market layer with what they, we all know, okay? So basically like uh, you can see like some of them use like detecting specifically virtual PC, some of them using like techniques of SLODT which doesn't work with Zen. So basically if you have like a KMU with Zen, uh, uh, KVM, you're gonna be okay. You can analyze malware and they are not going to detect you, okay? Don't, don't buy like this big, very expensive sandbox they're selling you. <laughs> if you look into the anti-disassembly technique, although there are like many techniques, uh, we're looking into eight, although there are like eight techniques that we look at, like basically they use like two of them and that's it. 
So it's not like, hey, the guy is looking into a mirror and there's an end to disassembly and now he takes forever. It's very hard to analyze. No, it's quite simple. Okay? If you know the technique, you just you know, like write your disassembly accordingly and now you're good to go. So it's not really like the mowers are very complex as people are trying to point it. If you look into the anti-debugging, then you have something which is also funny. 71% of them use a Microsoft function for detecting the debugger. Nice, Microsoft. Thank you again, right? <laughs> and it's interesting because like 71% detects Microsoft and then like 17% it's another feature of Microsoft. So like basically they really, really count on the support of the operating system to detect the debugger. It's very nice of Microsoft helping like the good guys. Oh, sorry, they are the bad ones, right? <laughs> so the guy from Microsoft thought it was funny as well. <laughs> the same goes for obfuscation techniques, okay? Most of the obfuscation ways, most of the ways that you obfuscate are very simple to actually you to identify. So they are not really counting on complexity. They, most of the samples are using like one technique, one specific technique. The differences are really high. And some of them use like two or three together, but you don't really mind. So that means you don't really need to write 50 techniques for detection with, I don't know, 15, you're already really good to go and you're going to detect like 90% of the samples. So it's interesting, right? Because why they are not doing it? I don't know. You remember, guys? If they win, they lose. So I, I, I'm not meaning to say that this alone will solve the problem, right? Of course, if they start detecting, what's going to happen is the malware authors will fall back and will stop using the techniques, will stop using the protection mechanism. But then it's much more feasible for anal analyzing. So new, new trends, future directions. Uh, we know that nowadays there are malware that when they are installed, they get information about the machine they are running and they refuse to run in a different machine. So the flashback malware for Mac was a good example of that. So when it, when it gets installed in the machine, it collects information on the machine, it doesn't run in anything else. So it took quite some time for people to actually figure out about the malware, because basically if you receive the sample, you will try to run it, it's not going to run, it's not going to do anything malicious. So you believe it's okay, it's not a malicious sample, right? That tries to defeat the, the dynamic analysis. So here's a proposition. Instead of trying to look into what we need to include in the environment in order to actually analyze the samples, or instead of trying to do manual analysis on those samples, or why don't we just try to document and detect the ways they use to identify the machine? And then we have a detection of anti-dynamic analysis capability. So that's a, 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 a something that we need to research more because it's very easy for us to just say, yeah, you know, like they can do whatever. Yeah, but what they actually I think if we start detecting the techniques they use, we're going to have a good way to go. I can't be sure. The only way to be sure is be scientific, start analyzing. I really don't like the researchers going there and just saying, yeah, now we have this other problem. OK, let's put science on it. Let's look into the number of techniques that exist out there, what they are using, if there is ways to modify the technique, if there is variations, and let's detect them as well. And then we look into the amount of samples out there, and we see what is the prevalence of those techniques. And then we define if it, it's worth to try to combat them or not. The way the industry is, is playing nowadays is more like a, a marketing game, right? they doing whatever makes marketing. They don't do whatever is really important or whatever is it, fundamental. And uh, just to conclude, the idea of the talk was exactly that, to be very random, to throw you guys some problems, to throw you guys some ideas, to tell you that the attack is as advanced as the defense. It's not even more advanced than the defense, right? Because you need to first defend for them to attack. So you need to have your system up, so they attack. You need to have DP, so they bypass DP. So they are exactly as advanced as your defense. So if the guys are saying the attacks that we see are advanced, that means they really suck defending. Really, sorry. The attacks are not advanced. They could be much, much worse. So we don't know if they have the capabilities because we are not defending well. 
uh, we need new ways to look into the problems. I am sure about that. And uh, how are we going to push the economics change? I don't know. But a really interesting thing and something that I really want you guys to think about is how do we help the academia? We are lost if the academia does not help us. But first, we need to help them because they are completely lost. Like, we have a lot of talents, a lot of smart people doing things that are really not helping at all. So how do we help them to actually help us? I really don't think we have a way to solve the problem if we don't help the academia. So thank you very much, guys. <laughs>